Narcissus in the brambles, brightest flower, I chose you from all others for my love. Sweet fruit tree growing wild within the thickets, I blossom in your shade and taste your love. Parallel the care the dancer takes by Hafiz. Parallel the care the dancer takes on her finest step. You need to feel the craving for that unison. You need to know all the longing the great ones had to suffer. Before God said to them, here I am, yours to do with whatever you like. And when will the beloved say such a sublime thing to you, give you all that power? A prerequisite is, when all you touch, you touch as if it were sacred. That will bring your mind to a standstill. The space between you and any object will then open up into a sea of radiance where you can drown for a second, drown and taste me. Beautiful, thank you. Aren't those juicy texts? Yeah. They're all juicy in their own right. And both Hafiz and the author of the Song of Songs invite us to taste the divine presence, to have a deep communion, union, which is another way of saying, again, having direct experience with the divine. All of these texts refer to a kind of divine partnership, which also leads to unity. As we said before, it is both the sacred marriage of the yin and yang within ourselves, and as above, so below, reflected in the divine partnership of the divine masculine and the sacred feminine. Together, they create a kind of whole. And I have chosen several paintings today to help reflect that. We have the icon here of Jesus and Mary Magdalene with the chalice of fire between them. And we also have Manusha's painting of a butterfly and a flower entitled A Love Story to talk about it beyond masculine and feminine terms, but as the attractor and the one that they are attracted to, right? And as I mentioned before, we know now from National Geographic that an article that they wrote uh, that there's literally a positive and negative charge emitted from the flower that it literally attracts the pollinators. And the pollen will literally start to fly off before the bee or the butterfly lands on the flower and lands on the pollinator. There is literally an electromagnetic force, right? That is part of the force in the universe that we celebrate when we celebrate the sacred marriage. And we've talked about it, that we're celebrating this particularly in May because of the celebration of May Day, which in Gaelic is Beltane or Beltane, right? Which is also the celebration of the Maypole. And we talked a little bit about that on the 7th. So we may be familiar because most of us are from European heritage. We may be familiar with that celebration of the union of the God and goddess of Beltane. But we might not be as familiar with the similar festivals actually that were within the Jewish tradition and within the Middle Eastern tradition actually. And they all centered around the Song of Songs. You may know it as the Song of Solomon, but it's actually, believe it or not, in our canonical Bibles, right? I'll often say this to a wedding couple and they will start to blush. And most aren't aware that it's even printed it in our canonical Bible. How it made the cut is kind of miraculous because if you read it, you find out very quickly it's erotic love poetry. There's no other way to say it. I have a, a copy there on the altar if you'd like to peruse it when we're done. All sorts of theologians have tried to make it merely an allegory between God and Israel. Let's just to tame it down about a hundred notches because it is erotic love poetry. And it's not just between a man and a woman, it's between the bride and the bridegroom, the king and the queen, 
who are the representations of the divine masculine and the sacred feminine. This was seen as two parts of a whole that go together and are celebrated together intentionally. So these festivals were held and this very text was sung antiphonally in these beautiful rituals. <clears throat> and it was carried on for centuries within the Hebrew tradition and within other parts of Canaan, Samaria, and Egypt in a variety of different ways. <clears throat> So it was seen as not only a fertility ritual, which would help bless the crops, but also as something that blessed the whole community with an elevation of consciousness, as we remembered that we all actually embody both the divine masculine and the sacred feminine, and you needed both together to make this sacred partnership. It is clear to me as I study the whole of the Christian mystical scriptures, that this was carried on in early Judaism by Jesus and followers. This is also traced throughout Gnostic Christianity. We have the evidence of this in particular through the Gospel of Philip, which, as you may know, is one of the Gospels found in the cave near the village of Nag Hammadi in 1945, that has given us this treasure trove of other Gospels that existed in many of them in the first century, but were banned by Rome and didn't make it into the canonical Bible. So throughout the Gospel of Philip, the bridal chamber is referenced. The passage that was read today are excerpts throughout the Gospel of Philip of every time the bridal chamber is mentioned. It is a sacrament, an actual sacrament. It's not just an allegory. It is a metaphor for our own divine union with divine presence. But it was seen as a whole as an initiation with four other sacraments. <clears throat> in the Gospel of Philip, it says, Yeshua did everything in a mystery, a baptism, a chrism, a Eucharist, a redemption, and a bridal chamber. Five actual sacraments that all made together a particular kind of initiation of higher consciousness. It was the higher consciousness that included the partnership of the divine masculine and the sacred feminine. This is particularly interesting when you look at how Mary Magdalene is listed in the Gospel of Philip. She is named as the Konoinos of Yeshua, which translates as companion, but it's not just sort of companion, like friend, buddy, like, oh, all of his disciples were companions. Nope. This is reserved actually for a sexual partner who is an intimate companion to the person being mentioned. In that same gospel, it famously says that Jesus used to kiss her often on the mouth and that the rest of the disciples were jealous because they thought he loved her more than that. And when Jesus calls them out on it, he says, you wanna know why I love her more? Because she sees and others remain in the dark. So he's clearly saying it's because she has spiritual awakening, because she's able to hold spiritual consciousness with him. So they are spiritual companions on a deep, deep level. And that is why he hangs out with her so much. It is, if we put that together with this ancient tradition of the Song of Songs, then it's clear that if Jesus and Mary Magdalene have some sort of sacred partnership, that they're holding actually energies that are larger than themselves. The bride and the bridegroom in the Song of Songs are holding the energies of the Logos Sophia, the divine masculine and the sacred feminine. The Logos is a phrase we might be familiar with if we grew up in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is most famously listed in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word or the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. It is in Hebrew, the same word is Dawar, which is the divine word. It's the word that creates. It's the word in the beginning of Genesis when God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's the saying or the singing of it that creates it. That's why it's called word, but it's not word like we have it today. It's a living word, right? It is very exactly what Manush has created in the cosmic mother. 
that which is sung into being. That is the presence of the logos. Now, what's interesting, a lot of people don't realize that the logos has its own feminine counterpart that's described in much the same way, and that is Sophia. The Sophia was present through all the different kinds of wisdom literature. Some of those made it into the canonical Bible, like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, but a lot more existed in other wisdom scriptures that were then found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, also in a cave outside of Egypt in 1945. There we have all this rich imagery associated to Sophia, like this passage from the Wisdom of Solomon that was used to inspire the call to worship we have today. From the Wisdom of Solomon. I will tell you what wisdom is and how she came to be. And I will trace her path from the beginning of time. She is a breath of the power of God and a pure flow of heaven's glory. She is a reflection of eternal light and an image of God's goodness. Wisdom was in the beginning with God. She is creation's artist and the fashioner of everything that exists. Do you see how similar that is to the beginning of John? Also speaking of this, what's interesting is how the passage ends. And so I loved her and sought her for my youth. I chose her as my bride and have delighted in her presence. The Holy Sophia is often referred to as the bride. She's believed to be the bride in the Song of Songs, the presence of the feminine. Now, I personally think it's unfortunate that the bride is so often reduced to simply the community of Israel or later than the church. To me, that can also be valid, but it takes away from the presence of the feminine in physical form. That in all of these ancient festivals, it just didn't make any sense to people to have one without the other. In the Kabbalah, everything is paired. So it would make no sense to completely eliminate the bride as a presence of the sacred feminine. The fact that this was continued, this understanding was continued within the early Christian movement of Jesus and his followers is clear when we look at how many times Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom. Ever stop to notice that? Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom throughout both the gospels and the epistles. There is a particularly interesting passage in John 3.29. When John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan, he has a big following. Jesus is also starting to baptize. Some of John's disciples come to him and like, hey, aren't you worried about this guy? Because he's going to steal all your followers. And John's like, no, no, not worried because I'm not supposed to be the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one preparing the way. And in order to designate himself saying that he's not the Messiah, John the Baptist says, it's he who has the bride that is the bridegroom. He's not the bridegroom. It's that one over there who has the bride that's the bridegroom. Now, when we look at that and we look at the fact that Mary Magdalene was very likely a priestess in her own right, who was very likely seen by those who knew her as perhaps the embodiment of the sacred feminine, then it's signaling that one over here that's connected to her, that's the real bridegroom. Now, to be able to even imagine that, we have to completely re-educate ourselves on who Mary Magdalene was and who she wasn't. What we know for a fact, which I will say every single time we talk about her, is that she was not a prostitute. That was a smear campaign created by Pope Gregory in the year 591 in a sermon. We have a sermon, we can prove it. No evidence in the canonical gospels at all. He literally pulls it out of thin air and then marks her as the woman who was unnamed in Luke's gospel who anointed Jesus' feet with oil, which by the way, is a very sacred act. There's no word prostitute mentioned in it. I've always thought it's no coincidence that he preached that sermon at a time when in France, the Cathar movement was growing very popular. Women were in leadership. They, they were following the teachings of Mary Magdalene. So in order to, if you want to really tame that down, what you would do is discredit her, which worked really well. 
Then in addition to that, so many of the passages that talk about Mary Magdalene as a spiritual leader were intentionally cut out and burned, okay? So what we're left with is just a little itty bitty drop of who she was. When we look at those other gospels, the gospel of Philip, the peace to Sophia, the dialogue of the savior, the gospel of the lovely companion, and I could go on. She is described as this. She is described as a spiritual leader in her own right. This is a woman with the mudra of a teacher of the apostle. She's the apostle to the apostles. When we look at all of these passages, it's very clear that Jesus refers to her as one who gets it, as one who has spiritual consciousness. She has her own visions. She then starts teaching the disciples. That is a woman who could do this, hold the Holy Sophia in balance, in partnership with the divine master. Now, there are some who say, okay, but if she was like maybe his wife then, why isn't she listed as such in the scripture? Why does she refer to Jesus as Rabunai, which means teacher rather than husband? First of all, that wouldn't be written down. That would be too intimate of a thing to write down in something like a gospel. It would not seem, be seen as a sign of respect. Second of all, it is quite possible that it wasn't safe for them to list her as his wife. Because we can't underestimate the power and presence of Rome and Roman occupation in that time. All of Jesus' followers watched him crucified, tortured. That was a very intentional fear campaign, right? There were threats on Mary Magdalene's life. That's why she fled to the south of France. If she also bore his children, then even years after his death, their lineage would have been at stake. So it wasn't safe to list her as his wife. There are those that believe she was intentionally concealed in that way to protect her. And yet in the canonical gospel, she's always, always, always listed first in the list of women above Jesus's mother, which would have never happened unless she was his wife, right? It's like a sleuth. You start to get into like this, you know, treasure hunt once you start to dig these things over. So we actually have plenty of evidence to support her. We just have to dig in order to find it. So it is quite possible that she was a woman of spiritual consciousness in her own right that could have held the presence consciousness of the Sophia to help balance his consciousness of the Logos so that together they were holding something bigger than themselves that was meant to bring in this love and this beauty and this joy into the world. And to me, it's important for us to remember that. It's important for us to remember these festivals. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. And you may come up with your own, but to make it easy, I've come up with three. One, I think it's important because it restores the bride to her rightful place as partner to the bridegroom. She's not just erased anymore. And that tells us that the feminine values and principles and women in general, we are not inferior. We might think that way, oh yeah, we've come so far and it's all true, but spiritually, we are not inferior. And we don't have enough models. We don't have enough spiritual models out there to say, oh look, that could be me. This could be each one of us, whether men or women, because for men, it's also important to be able to hold and embody the feminine principle as not weak, right? As not something other than or lower than, but that those parts of men are just as important too. So to me, it is important to celebrate this sacred partnerships because it reminds us that both actually are equal, which is important. Second of all, I think it highlights that this is how the divine created the whole universe, to be in relationship. All kinds of relationships. Doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. Could be butterfly and flower. Could be same sex, transgender, non-binary. Also, we all have relationships with all sorts of beings, with plants, 
with animals, with friends, with family. The pandemic has taught us anything. It's that we were not created to be isolated and to do everything alone. To honor the sacred marriage, the sacred partnership reminds us that we are designed to be in relationship and relationship is holy and good. And the whole universe and cosmos is designed in these pairings and it doesn't make it dualistic. It just makes it both and relationship. So we can celebrate the relationships in our lives and that we're not meant to be lone rangers. If we make Jesus out to be a lone ranger, in my opinion, we do him a disservice because then our own vulnerabilities are not seen as sacred. And then thirdly, I think it reminds us that the body is sacred. You look at that and read the Song of Song and remember that it was included in sacred scripture. There's no other way to see it, except that our bodies are sacred. Sexuality is sacred. Sensuality is sacred. That's how it was intended. What happened later in this kind of puritanical think within the Christian tradition, I think has done all of us this service. But as we remember this kind of amazing poetry and passages, we can then too celebrate our bodies as sacred, our sensuality and sexuality as sacred. There's I'm sure more that we could say about it, but I will pause there. And then invite each of one of us to think, to reflect, how does this make a difference in your life? This knowledge, these sacred partnerships. So I invite us actually just to spend a little time in silence, literally even maybe reflecting on some of the images and perhaps some of the sacred texts. And to just take a moment in silence before we speak, to just ponder all that we've reflected on today. Again, as we reflect, I invite you to, again, take a good look at this, at this painting. And I'm going to show, hold it up again for those on Zoom uh, so you can perhaps see it a little more clearly. And uh, notice what you notice about the, this is very done. This was a commission by a friend of mine. Um, so it was very intentionally done to show the equality. And then you have a, hidden chalice in the middle. Um, and then again, this, even this has another way to talk about the same thing. So what are you noticing? What bubbles up for you, either from the imagery or from the sacred text? Go ahead and, yeah, go ahead and look. 